musicians, amen, and we welcome everyone. We're going to dedicate a, not, a, not, 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 not quite a baby, we're going to dedicate a little Lloyd Thomas. Uh, Dusty was telling me he thinks it's time before he joins the gang in the neighborhood. He's getting older. We want to pray. It's wise, really wise as a parent and a Christian person to want to dedicate your children. What that means often to me, what it really means to many, many parents to do this, is they want God's help making sure that child becomes who God wants them to be. They want to raise them that way. So why don't you join with us this morning. Stand with me, if you would, and let's all pray. We're going to dedicate this little guy unto the Lord right now in Jesus' name. God, touch, Lloyd. I pray, touch his father and mother. And God, all the days of his life, guide them and help them, even with wisdom and anointing. Touch this young man that by the grace of God, your spirit would be upon him all the days of his life. Lord, they dedicate him unto you, your purpose, your destiny for his life. I pray you would counsel him with the spirit of the living God and with wisdom. Help him, Lord, all his days. In Jesus' name, watch over him, help them, bless them as they raise this child unto you and your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, buddy, you're in. God bless you guys. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, tough case, so we're going to believe God. Uh, just kidding. Amen. We wanted to help them with that. Uh, I want to preach to you a sermon I call a look behind the curtain this morning. If you want to open your Bible to 2 Corinthians 4, you can read there with me. Glad to see you this morning. And, uh, I, you know, I, I know there's some new folks. I caught a glimpse of you coming in. We're glad you're here. If it's your first time or you've just been visiting, you know, once or twice, we're so glad you're back and we want you to be here. I was thinking about the way many people view um, Christianity and the church and God's people and preachers and everything else. Like I said this morning, I had relatives that had never set foot in our church, and yet they had the wisdom to tell you, watch out, all they want is your wallet. They had no idea what goes on in our church. I had others caution me over the decades of my salvation about watch out for this in the church, watch out for that. And when you sit and have a discussion with me, you find out they have no church experience. They just know things, you know, they think. And I was thinking of this issue, how it blinds so many people, or why are they blinded with this, and how it hurts them. And I was pondering a scene from The Wizard of Oz. Any of you ever see that old ancient movie? 1939, it's an oldie. Amen. It was black and white back when I viewed it as a child. Amen. Uh, I went to a rich relative's house and watched this from behind their sofa, you know, in the living room, terrified, out of my skin, man, just going crazy. And, uh, but in the movie and in the book, you know, there is a lost girl. She wants to find her way home, right? You know, it's, 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 you know, really a harmless little movie. And there's, uh, that's Dorothy. There's a tin man. He has no heart, uh, or yeah, what has he got? No, he has no brain. There is the scarecrow who's, uh, you know, just, uh, what, what did he need? Courage. Courage? We got it backwards. Okay, all these guys had great needs. Hallelujah. There's a scarecrow, there's a tin man, and there's a cowardly lion. He needed courage. You guys got it dead wrong over here, Okay. So anyhow, so here's these guys. They all had great need. Oh, I wrote it down. Courage, heart, brain. Okay. And uh, uh, what, uh, I don't know. Anyway, they, uh, and then, of course, those flying monkeys, amen, it just terrorized us to no end. And, uh, but there was this hope that they could make it to the land of Oz and see the wizard, right, the mysterious wizard. And uh, so when they get there, they see this big smoke, you know, all the smoke, welling up and a little bit of lights flickering and a big curtain. Remember the scene? And of course, there was an awesome presence and voice there that was the wizard. And it struck fear in everybody. Remember that? Everyone just cowered down. like, Ooh. But they wanted his help. They wanted his wisdom, his, what he offered, what they couldn't get anywhere else. And I thought to myself, you know, if you remember the little Dog finally pulled back some of the curtain or something. And there they find he's just this little old guy. And so they, you never know what's behind the curtain. A lot of people view their, the world around them 
like that. They, they look at the church. They're drawn because they think they need God. They do. They need maybe some religion. I'm surprised at how often I talk to people or even read little things here and there about people who, you know, they're drawn to religion a little, just enough. You know, they think about just enough to make themselves feel okay. But I want to tell you what you really need is to know who's behind it all. It's God. And you need to get past your thoughts on what the curtain is or who's there or what's there. 2 Corinthians 4 Verses 1 through 6, just six verses as we begin. And the Apostle Paul is the man that penned these words, and he says, Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness or handling of the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing, those whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves, your bondservants, for Jesus' sake. For it is the God, it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. You know, many people's view of the church and of religion and of God, it's veiled by a great curtain and it's nothing but mysterious. I want to tell you, you're not going to just sort out and figure out God. He, he's a mystery in some ways, but he is almighty God. He's the power behind it all. And many have come into the kingdom with a bit of a skewed view, for lack of a better way of saying it. They don't have a real working uh, perspective of perceiving God. You know, they have their ideas and their thoughts. And I was going to use an illustration tonight, but I'm going to use it now. I was reading about a guy and his wife that wanted to have a Bible study they want to know God. They, want, they, they, feel they, they really feel they're born again, and they, they got the goods, and they want to teach people and help people. But what they did is they knocked on doors around the neighborhood, invited a bunch of people. And I'm reading his own testimony about it. So then we went home and really didn't think anybody was going to show, so we decided we better pray. We prayed, and then we were shocked because a whole handful of neighbors showed up. And so we decided... What do you guys want to do and have a Bible study? And so they, he, they asked all the people that came. He didn't know them. They're all just a bunch of strangers. You know, people live around the neighborhood. And uh, they decided, I don't know. What do you want to do? Well, I want to study. How do you study? Well, the, this guy's been saved a while, and he knows some scripture. He goes, Mark is the simplest or shortest gospel. Let's start there. And so they decided they'd read the chapter 1 for this study, and everyone would read a verse and go around. Then they, they'd give their opinion on the verse and I, I tell you, I saved, I, I read part of it, and I stopped, and I said, I'm going to save this. It's, it's unfortunately, it's very sad, but it, it just makes you, what? The ideas that they each rendered about each verse, it had nothing to do with what God was saying. And each one would say things like, I know, but that's the way I like thinking about it. That's how I view it. That's what I would do, one says, if I was God. Sheesh, but that's not what it says. But each one had an opinion. This guy writes this article about his experience. And then I'm thinking, my goodness, people have a very skewed view of things. They want God to be what they think they want him to be, not who he is. He's still God. And there were things in there, and they were talking about gender and stuff, and saying, well, that's not the God I believe in. And so, you know, he created man and woman. That's how he made them in his image to be this way. You know, he didn't create 87, um, you know, different. He made a man and woman. And they said in there, it was just amazing. He writes down everything. He thought it was pretty cool. We had a great discussion. A discussion about what? Nobody stumbled into the truth. But people have funny ideas how he operates. Sometimes they think he just blesses what he wants and when he wants. Sometimes, you know, maybe they think they can find the blessing tree and stand around there. And 
Some are scared. It's kind of reminiscent of Dorothy and her haphazard friends in Oz. You know, they're, they want to see the awesome Oz, but they're terrified. Remember when he'd start to speak, they'd all shake, and then they'd stand up and they'd shake. And they, they're drawn, but they don't want They're almost in, but they're not. And they have their own ideas how it works. And a lot of people think that's God. He's just a big, scary presence. And you try. You try to tap into him. You reach in a little, but you don't get what you want, and you just go another direction. It's intimidating. Oz made demands on those guys. Remember that? I can't remember them all. I just want to tell you, I was this big when I saw it. So, uh, you know, you, you put, and they think that's a God. He's going to demand for me to be this way, do this, and I'm scared I won't measure up. And I, you know, you, you don't have a right understanding of God. Not like you can understand him or I can explain him. I'm saying you don't know him if that's how you think. They run out from his presence, unsure of who he was and is and what he operates, and then they just don't get it. And, and then, you know, a lot of problems, a lot of problems stem from that confusion. It's, it's just kind of reminiscent of that old Wizard of Oz thing. They just hide from that presence, and then they find out there's nothing to fear back there at all. Well, I want to tell you something. There was a separation between us and God. It was called our sin. It is a big, bad curtain, man. It was a dark place. Jesus found a way to shred that curtain and make a way for us to come into God's presence. You know what you find? Yes, he is an awesome being. Yes, he is beyond what you could imagine, but he is the God of love, the God of redemption, the God of forgiveness, the God of provision. But you know, when we have this skewed view of God, we miss God. We also have a skewed view of the church. And it blows my mind how people have ideas of churches. And, and you know, they, they're looking for a church that's going to fill the, the, the image of a church they got in their mind. And it may not even be at all what the Bible has to say church is. Very, various people, they view the clergy you know, I was raised, you know, the, the, the clergy, they wore these big, long robes, and you couldn't never see their feet. You didn't even know if their feet touched the ground when they walked around. The, and there was always smoke and stuff around the altar. And in those days, it was mysterious, you know. And the clergy, you know, people, people crack me up. They, they look at people like me, and they see this nice-looking old grandpa in a nice suit and clean cut. And then they get around you. One time when we were here, probably just... Three or four years, I scored a bunch of green chili. It's just one of my um, small great pleasures in life, you know, when I can get that fresh out of New Mexico and roast it up. And so I, I was living in my first house where we first moved here. We got to town. The backyard was a swamp. Literally, to, to go up in my yard, you wore rubber boots. It was just a wet spot. A lot of you know what those wet spots are around here. You live in one. And so I didn't know anyone was coming over. I had some old shorts on, a t-shirt was all stained up, and I was sweating like crazy. Had a bandana on, it was hot, September day, very humid. I lit this fire, I'm standing by the fire roasting chili in myself, and I've got a bucket of chili here, bags there, I got this going, and I'm standing out in the midst of this, and all of a sudden I hear someone go, Pastor? A brand new convert in the church just saved a short while. Her husband I turned around. When I turned around, they went, you know, that's you? That's me. You know, you know, you, maybe you could picture that. The rubber knee boots, the shorts, the dirty old shirt. And you're no pastor. I, I'm your pastor. Let me go change. Run behind the curtain, you know. But it, it's just amazing what people think. I got saved. And I, I had no idea what a pastor was. We lived with our pastor for a short while, and I found out, man, he's a guy. He's a man. You know, it, it's amazing how people think. You should be, well, you know what? You should be clean, just like I should be clean in our hearts, right, with God. Should have some good Christian habits about us, but you know what? We live on this earth. But people have these ideas, and they look at, you know, like, Preachers make, they have mistake-free existence. They don't, you know, we had a couple of folks helping us out. We went to conference, Tom and Julie, and, and it, it just cracked me up. They came over, and we were going to, we're lining them out on a couple of things we're going to do for our 
my, my wife's birds and stuff in the mornings and make sure everything's alive when we get home. Thank you, guys. You did a great job. Too. And, and so I'm supposed to be running them through everything, and I didn't realize I was running them through everything. I, I was just there doing my stuff, and Vanita was talking to them, and then uh, Vanita said, well, Dave probably already told you. And I looked, and they looked, and he, said, he didn't say anything. And I said, oh, yeah, I forgot. And I think it was Julie says, you forget things? Yes, I do. I write everything down, man. I tell you, if you want me to remember it, I write it down. I, we're people. But some people, think, well, the pastor, he has all the answers because they want him to, but they make sure that they have to be the answers they want. That's, <laughs> then it's okay. And if his answer isn't that answer, he doesn't get it. Or if I don't have an answer and I have told people, I'm sorry, I, you know what, I'm going to have to pray. Why don't you run that by, meet me again tomorrow, we'll talk. And I've had people look like, what? We thought you knew everything. I don't. Pastor King does. No, we don't. <laughs> Neither one of us does. And we're certain Dusty Spicer doesn't. Amen. So... No, we don't know everything. We're just trying to do what we're called to do. And we're doing our best we can, and we're human beings. But see, people got this idea that there's this, this you know, like, the, like that curtain, you know, this, oh, this is the place, man, all the answers flow. And I want to tell you, then they have this thought that I'm coming to a perfect church. I know none of you have not because you go to church here. You know. And there isn't one. But you know, I have honestly, it's been hundreds of people I've dealt with over my years in the church that are looking for a perfect church. And I have to tell every single one, if you find it, you're not getting in. <laughs> they won't ruin it for you. It, it, so it's, it's amazing. People have these skewed views and ideas and it seems as though they took this great Oz view and it's into the house of God with them and somehow Toto got in and pulled the curtain and it's like, well, this wasn't at all what I thought. It's not. This is God's house and it's imperfect people saved by God's grace, washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. And we now have this ministry, as the apostle wrote in our text. He says, you know, if you knew him beforehand, you would say, He's not going to be my preacher. Not that Saul of Tarsus. He can't lead me. He can't blah, blah. But he says, nope, now we have this ministry because we got mercy. And we don't lose heart because we, we have renounced those hidden things of shame. The stuff we were, we're not what we were. We don't walk in craftiness. We're not handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, uh, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. What he's saying there is to quote that old seafaring man, Popeye, I am what I am because of God. Uh, this is who I am, and it's the best I can do. And he says, but if this gospel seems veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. So what he's saying there is, there is this problem. People don't get it. They don't get, you know, they, they, they're right. No, you're, this is imperfect. I'm a, I thought it would be. I heard this. I'm looking for that. And they don't get it. Well, something's wrong with everyone else. But no, the writer here says, no, the problem is your own eyes. You're blinded. And how does that happen? By the refusal to believe. The refusal to receive and trust God. So we need to see beyond the surface. And Christ enables us to live a transparent life. It's not like we, you know, I don't care what anyone sees anymore. Yeah, it's just no, we, you know, Paul makes a statement through the scriptures several times. He reminds us what a wicked man he was and how bad he was in his sin, but he did it in his ignorance, and he's not that man today. So he says, yeah, I, this is what... But sin was a blinding force. The Bible makes so clear that Jesus enabled people of every ilk to find a transformation within himself. I can't help at times like this 
what I'm thinking in the terms of what I'm preaching this morning to think of that guy we call him, we know him in the Bible as the Gadarean demoniac. This guy was out of his mind in darkness, bound in sin. So many demons tormenting him. When Jesus spoke to him, it was a demon problem. He says, so what's your name? And all he could say is legion because there's so many demons in here. Legion means a great multitude, folks. That's a lot. And he says, I have these problems. This guy didn't wear clothes. This guy lived in a graveyard. This guy was the original cutter and piercer. You know, he loved to feel that pain. He didn't know how to be normal. He couldn't, he just terrified the community. He'd wander himself into town to go terrify people. And men would take him and tie him up and drag him out and chain him out there. But he'd break the chains. Cut himself up, bloody mess, run back into town. He lived this way. We don't know how long, but that's how he lived. But when Jesus saved him, the Bible says he fell down at Jesus' feet. They clothed him. And when Jesus walked away and was leaving town, this man was clothed and in his right mind. You know what that did? It scared the people of the town. They said, we don't, we don't get this at all. This man said to Jesus, let me go with you, Lord. Remember that? Right, why did he say that? Probably just think about it. Would you want to go back to town? Say, hey, everybody, I'm back. They run from you, hide their kids, you know. This, Jesus said, no, stay here and tell them what great things God has done for you. And you know what the Bible tells us and sheds light on? He did. He declared it all over the place. What a powerful thing. Now, he's, not, he's not bragging about what he was. He's saying, he's saying, this is what Jesus did in this mess of me and changed me. And Jesus was able, we know by the gospel accounts, to touch anybody who would believe. Yet there were some places Jesus went and he couldn't do anything because they wouldn't believe. So what does our text say? You know what? It's the people who don't see through this and get it, they're blinded. You know why? Because they refuse to believe. And the God of this world, Satan is who that is. You say he's not a God. I know. That's a small g in your Bible. What it means is it's, you know, he's a false God. And when Jesus touches the life, then he enables that person to begin to live in transparency. In other words, he can live, she can live the life. Mary Magdalene was a bad woman with bad reputation and many demons to herself. Nasty person. She became one of the great followers of Jesus Christ, a servant to him and others. The Gadarene, Peter, all the guys, they all were... And they're transparent. Zacchaeus, a little sinner, thief, great thief this man was. And all of a sudden he says, no, I'm going to live my life where anybody can look at it. He can see me. He can know. And Paul says, you know what? I am able to do this today because Jesus changed my life. So wherever I was, not that today, this enables us to live without any pretense or deceit. There is power in the testimony. I say this quite often over the pulpits. I preach in our pulpit and other places. There are people everywhere who need to hear your testimony. What God has done in you. How real he is. What trans transforms you. How you've been changed. And there's a great linking of our faith at saving faith we have to speaking what we believe. And if we speak what we were in our sin and what we are now in Christ, we can bring hope to people. And our text states these former things I've been and I've renounced those hidden things. I am now living where you can see how I live. I remember when I first got saved, I think it was only the first Saturday after I was saved, a brother from the church came out. It was a September, August day in uh, the mountains of Arizona. Just nice, you know, but it was warm uh, for us. We, you know, it was warm up there. And uh, he came over and we came in the living room and I was walking one way and he was coming around. I said, oh, do you want something cold to drink? And uh, he said, sure. And I deliberately stopped and I said, well, help yourself. Because I thought to myself, wow, anyone can look in my refrigerator now. There's nothing hidden in there. No stash. No more booze. And you can even open the freezer. You can look at the cupboard above. You, anywhere you want. I've got clean. 
I'm not what I was. It's a transparency. And that's what the writer is saying is, is if we don't, there's nothing hidden. The problem is people just don't see when they refuse to have faith. I mean, I look out of this church, I see lovely testimonies, one after another, man. Bunches of them, all you guys. But you know, others can come in and say, no, nah, I haven't found the perfection I'm looking for. 1 Corinthians 2, the apostle wrote, same apostle, chapter 2, verse 1, I, brethren, when I came to you, I didn't come with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and much trembling. My speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but the power of God. He's saying there, I came as I am. I didn't pretend to be something else. I gave you this gospel as best I could, and I wanted to bring you to a place of faith where you'd put your faith in the wisdom, power of God and not just in somebody's wisdom. I was witnessing to someone recently and, uh, and, and found out I was a preacher and uh, we went on for a while and he made a comment to me about uh, Joe Osteen. And uh, I can't remember how this came. It was a long conversation I had with this fellow trying to help him. He needs Christ and he was wide open and uh, and he makes some Joel Osteen comment. And before I could defend myself, he goes, you are not Joel Osteen. I said, thank you. I'm not a hawker making money off this, selling things, fast faith business, you know. But he was able to discern, you know, and that's what he's saying. I'm trying to find my way. I'm watching, reading, doing things. And he said, but I'm talking to you in person. He's saying, this is, this is so different than the nonsense being sold in the name of religion. And that's all just the smoke and mirrors come into a fancy place. Good show, good lighting, great makeup, great acting. You know, uh, you know, Pastor King, Pastor Spicer and I, we've come to the conclusion, you know, maybe we should just do live broadcasting over the air and not, you know, we don't have those. We have radio faces, you know, and we don't know how to act. It's not our gig. But we want to preach, preach truth. And that's what Paul said, however, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. So Paul's saying, you know, Men can't see into this. Even the people that crucified Jesus, they thought, you know, that's what we see, that's what we get, we're taking care of this the way we want. But, you know, they couldn't kill him and leave him in the grave. He rose from the dead. They thought they were solving their problem. We don't want his religion. We don't want him preaching. We don't want his influence. We don't want to hear what he's saying. And they crucified him, but he rose from the dead. So... What the writer's saying is, you know, people just look at face value or surface value. They don't know what's behind the curtain. I want to tell you, there's no smoke and mirrors and there's nothing behind the curtain here except Jesus Christ. We're trying to present him right out front. The one who changes lives. The writer in our text says, you know, nothing to hide. We are what we are. We're just bringing the word of God. Today's world, very treacherous times upon us. You know, there's a lot of deceit in the world today. The social network is just a, uh, man, it's a mountain of deceit, pretense and deception. You know, there, it's hard to know true identity online. Can you say amen? It's a world of bots today. I, I remember I heard the word bot. I don't know how long I heard bots, but I don't know what a bot is. You know, a while back I went and looked it up. It's, talking, it's like the Twitter universe that that levies public opinion, it kind of sets out the stage. It's, it's just one guy knows how to produce a bunch of bots that he can produce a million views on something. One man, one woman, a million views. Oh, the whole world's thinking that way, huh? I better change my, no, no, no. It's, it's the deception that's out there in this world. It's rampant. 
It's spiritual. And you and I, by the grace of God, folks, we have been brought into a wonderful place, if we'll have it, in Christ. And we can have a great confidence that we can see beyond the surface with him, and we can be seen beyond the surface. You know, uh, Paul, this great apostle, he, he wrote to the Corinthians many times. If you are familiar with your Bible and the history of the church at that time, the church in Corinth, uh, he had a lot to do with it, but he, you know, he had great influence there. But, you know, that church, they, it was a, a bit of a Las Vegas type of craziness, you know, or California craziness. There was a bunch of immorality. And lots of stuff was public and in politics and in just insanity. And there was all kinds of wicked religion there, wicked religion, immoral religion. They practiced. And now the Christian church is being established and they would, they would they fail to judge certain things at times. They let stuff get loose and wicked behavior and things. And, and so Paul would have to bring down the hammer, so to speak, and bring them to light and give them some understanding and challenge truth to them, you know, bring them into truth. And, and so they would, they, it turns out what happens is some of them decided that, you know, somebody pulled the curtains on him and this guy's letters are pretty heavy duty, but when he comes, he's just this guy. When he comes to preach, he's just a man. And so, hey, do we have to? So he writes again in 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 1, Now I, Paul, myself, am pleading with you by the gentle, meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence I am lowly among you, but being absent I write these bold letters towards you. He's referencing that. You know, he says, I, I beg you, when I'm present, that I don't have to be bold that with that confidence by which I intend to be bold against some to think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For we, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. He's saying, I know I'm going to have to deal with things when I come and help make some judgments. There were some things that were wrong. We've got to deal with these people, straighten out some things. You can't have that kind of immorality in the church, other things that he had to deal with, and he's saying, and then there are some there that say, you know what, sure, he can write a bold letter, but you know, when he comes, he's just a guy, and what are we going to, he said, look, when I come, I'm going to deal with this stuff, and I'm going to have to be bold, and say, that, thus saith the Lord, it's right here in the Word, and we have to judge these matters according to it, and, and uh, you know, to get God's help here, and so he says, listen, what we're doing, this is not flesh, this is not me as Paul, this is not just we are people, but what we have is we are doing something spiritual, and we're not warring in the flesh. The weapons of our warfare, he said, they're not fleshly or carnal, but they're mighty in God for pulling down strongholds and casting down every argument, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity the, to the obedience of Christ, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. What he's saying here is, listen, we're, gonna, we're going to do things according to the word, not according to how we feel, what we would like, what we think. We have a spiritual power in God and an authority and a delegation from God to do this. And he says, do not look at things on the outward appearance. He said, it's got to go past that, beyond that. And he went and wrote on. He said, man, I know. Some of you seem terrified by my letters and my bodily presence is weak and this speech is contemptible and who knows. Who, you know. And he says, you know what? It's not about that. It's about what God is doing. And, you know, maybe perhaps this morning, my, my thought is, you know, many people come into our church. I don't know everybody. Uh, maybe you're visiting today even. And perhaps you've had some of these skewed views. Maybe you've been coming to church. And when's God going to do for me? You know, what I think he should, I see this and I want that. But you're not seeing what God is, who he is. And perhaps this morning, you're being blinded. That's what the Bible says. You don't see it. You don't see church for what it's supposed to be. You don't see the kingdom at all for what it's supposed to be. Where is that blindness coming from? Perhaps it's an unwillingness of your own heart to be surrendered to the word of God and to God himself. You know, I've had people tell me, well, I'd be witnessing or talking, or even heard a sermon, and then come up, I want to argue, and say, you, you're just telling me what you think. No, I cashed in my old ideologies and thoughts, and I begin to believe this, because I was wrong. And I want to be right, the only way to be right, align with God, and for God's purpose. And you know what? 
If Satan's been blinding you, I know who can take the blinders off. God can do it this morning. You say, I don't know. It's so powerful, the influence. I was raised this way. I was raised to not believe in the Holy Ghost. I was raised to not give money to the church. I was raised to, you know, this is right, that's wrong, this is the church has it. No, you know, it's time to get the blinders off. And it's powerful when you think about it. The Word of God says the reason these things can't be seen or understood is there's literally something there. Who's blinding you? The God of this world. You say, wow, that's power. That's weird. It, it is. But I want to tell you, not one of us is any match for Satan. Nobody. But Jesus Christ has defeated him. Matter of fact, Isaiah made a comment, well, not a comment, he gave us some insight into judgment, one of the final judgments of Satan himself. He's talking about Lucifer, and the word of God comes to him in Isaiah 14, 16. In this day, when he gets judged, those who see you will gaze at you and consider you saying, is this the man that made the earth tremble and shook kingdoms? Right now, he's a powerful force, but I'm going to tell you, if we see him in the light of the glory of God and the power of God, you can defeat him. You can see your way. You can get a look behind the curtain. Jesus Christ caused that curtain to be torn, beloved. I preached about this as I was wrapping up, or taught about it in our Sunday school a few months ago, wrapping up the Sunday school on personal holiness. Hebrews 10, 19, Therefore, brothers... Since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way open for us through the curtain of his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So what the scripture is saying there is, you know what? We need to now have a confidence to enter right in. Get behind the curtain and go right on into God's presence. You have this high priest, the one that made it available, the connection for you and God. That's Jesus Christ. Personally, he wants to help you, help every one of us. He has made the way by his own blood being sacrificed on Calvary's cross. What a, what a God we serve, folks. And the curtain. This is in connection, it really is, with the curtain that was torn when Jesus breathed his last breaths. Matthew 27 talks about that in 50 and 51, that the temple curtain that separated common people, you know, that big curtain, the, like in Oz, the one no one could get behind, what's back there, who's, what's going on, that big curtain, that was a big curtain. That curtain was most likely between 50 and 60 feet tall, solid woven curtain. Wide and up to four inches thick. I can't understand how you could do that four inches, but I guess you know you can. Maybe it's only two inches thick, but it's a curtain that God tore Himself from the top to the bottom. When Jesus breathed His last breath, that curtain was torn. It was recorded by historians. Why did that happen? Because God is saying access is open. Everyone can come on in. Jesus is a great Savior. And so, so the next verse, 25 in Hebrews 10 says, let's then hold resolutely or hold fast to the hope we profess because he is faithful who promised to us. Hallelujah. There is more than just hope. It's a reality. You, every one of you, every one of us, everyone that wants to believe can choose to believe and respect, repent. You know, do it God's way. And you know what? He'll bring you past the veil. Let's bow our heads this morning. If we could all do that together. And we'll pray. Our heads are bowed. Eyes closed for a moment. Just in reverence to God. I, I came to a church service similar to this smaller church. Just, you know, just came in when I was a young man in my early 20s. And my sin was taking a toll. I knew it was consuming my life. I had faith in God, but I didn't have saving faith. I'm preaching on that kind of faith tonight. I didn't, I didn't have what it, I didn't know. How is it I can believe in God and be so messed up? My sin eating me up, my life falling apart, things happening so rapidly to me that and I had no power to change. 
And, you know, I came into a church service similar to this, and at the conclusion, there was a call just like this to be saved. Preacher asked, if you are not washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, you have never been born again, you need God's forgiveness. You want to know his forgiveness and know that you are saved. You want to change and you want God's salvation. He asked us to lift our hands. Whosoever was there, only about 20 of us there. But I remember lifting my hand and saying, I, it, I need God. I don't know how. It's, I have not connected with all the religion. I'm Catholic through and through and all of the catechism and parochial school, everything. I still had no relationship with God. That evening, I said, God, I want you to help me take my sins and cleanse me. I want to be saved. Maybe that's your prayer. I have no regrets. I, that was the first time I did that, and I have surrendered to God several times since, in the early days especially. But I stay surrendered today. This is your need this morning. This is your prayer. We're already people are praying at this altar, and we're going to open the altar for prayer. But I wonder if this is your need. You say, yes, preacher, I need God's forgiveness. I want to get past that great confusion or veil. I want to know Jesus Christ as my Savior. I want his forgiveness and freedom. I want you to lift your hand. and Hold it up for just a moment where you're seated. God love you. You would lift it high. Hold it. Let me see it because I want to pray for you. I'm not going to ask you to come confess to me or to, you know, stand before the church and do this. And I'm going to ask you to surrender your heart to Jesus Christ. And you'd lift it right now. Lift that hand and say, Jesus, here I am. Lift it up towards heaven. Say, God, be merciful to me. I want a new life. I want forgiveness of my sins. And I want to be free. Backslidden, fallen from where you once were with God. Why don't you lift a hand? God bless you, young man. Who, who, I see your hand. Who else would raise a hand and say, pray for me? I, I, want, to, I want to get past you, you, you know, you know, you're probably thinking, how in the world did this sermon come down? Because I've had so much confusion when I look at church, the church world, God, this and that. And yes, that's why you, 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 that curtain's been there in the way. You've had a skewed view, so to speak. But this morning, it can be broken by your surrender to Jesus Christ. And by lifting your hand, you say, this is my prayer, to surrender to Christ and know his forgiveness. Hold it up where I can see it. Join these honest souls. Anyone else? Lifting a hand towards heaven, you'd say, pray for me too. Pray for me. I want to get my heart right with God. I want to be forgiven today. I want to know Jesus. Repent of my sin. God is a great Savior. If you lift a hand and lift it high, say, pray for me that I can repent and find Christ. I, I'm calling and co pursuing this call because oftentimes, man, we just have ideas about God, but we are not surrendered and born again. Is there someone that would lift a hand, clearly lift it up and say, pray for me. God bless you also, young lady. Amen. Honest hearts. Anyone else? Because we're going to change the order of the service, but you say, it's time for me just to surrender to Christ. I'm going to ask his help this morning and believe on him. Hallelujah. A handful of people that lifted their hands. If you lifted a hand today, I want you to look right up at me for a moment. Just be, just look up for a moment. And I want to, if you're sincere about it, you, you can come up to the altar and pray when we stand. There'll be a lot of people praying. And, and it would be really good for you. Just come visit with God yourself at the altar and let God help you. Let's all stand to our feet. The altar is open. And uh, maybe God's just dealing with you to press on through, man. Maybe you feel that you're, the blinders have been hindering you, and you realize it's just a lack of trust, and lack of belief. That's what the Bible says. Who is Satan blinding? Those that fail to believe. And God wants to help you this morning, especially if you raise a hand. Come up and find a place to pray. Surrender to Christ this morning. And allow God's great grace to flood your life, your soul.
Let's thank him together right now. God, we love your name, praising you above everything that is. You are worthy, O Lord. Yel and bende te de me ido san. Yen ye de hede shore sandura hasan. Alamando de la da bonde. Worthy, worthy God, you are worthy of every praise. Amen. And thank God, you know, what Jesus can do. For our spiritual vision, nothing else can. I'm amazed how many people in this world get in this program, buy into this online service and product and this book, this course, and yet uh, Jesus said the most critical issue of all, your saving of your soul, is you must be born again. You don't get that in a program in a bottle. You don't get that in a degree in a certificate. You get that through faith. And once the eyes are open, it's amazing. You know, when he, John chapter 3, might be good, maybe this is for you to read today. If you have these thoughts and questions, wondering about this. Because when the, the priest named Nicodemus, he's a guy that's supposed to know, a priest, get people to God, right? That's his job. Go to, asking Jesus, how do you get eternal life? And Jesus says, you don't know that? And what he's saying there is you can't see because you're not born again. And that's the thing Jesus says. Unless you're born again, you'll never see the kingdom. You won't see what church is about. You won't see what the preaching is about. You won't see what the kingdom. You just won't see it. You can't get it unless you're born of the Spirit. And so these things are spiritually understood. So thank God if you're praying this morning and asking God to save you, you're getting born again, man. You're having a new start. Everything, the whole new ballgame. Amen. He wipes the slate clean. The past is gone. That's like the great apostle. We read his words this morning. This guy was a treach treacherous egomaniac before he got saved. And all of a sudden now he's, he's the guy giving us the scriptures. Now, what power in the blood of Jesus changed our lives? Amen. Hallelujah. Let's go with the grace of God and the blessing of God upon our lives. And uh, please, you know, tonight we open the building at... Uh, uh, 5.30 for prayer, or you can come early and spend a few moments in the prayer room. It would be wonderful. Get, prime the pump of your heart before the Lord, and then 6.30, our worship service. Come be a part of it with us. Uh, you'll be blessed if you do. Amen. It'll be great to have you, and we encourage you to come right back this evening. Amen. And uh, let's just pray as we dismiss tonight. Uh, Brother Jeff Marty, could you just, or this, just today, just dismiss us to this evening service. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.